three MLRA soil office leaders. Uh, first up will be Jessica Lene Job. Next up will be Stephen Antes, and then Ryan Dermody. Also have Paul Fennell on the line, and he's going to talk to us uh, in the introductory to uh, explain the topic and then do the wrap up. A few things about our webinar today. Everybody's in listen only mode. And to ask a question, I'm going to ask you to uh, type in your question on using the Q&A tab at the top of your live meeting frame. And we'll take questions at the end. Today's webinar is a little bit longer than usual. We've got an hour and a half today to cover all the tips, tricks, and free advice that we can offer in SDJR. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Paul to introduce our topic and get things started. Welcome, everybody. I just wanted to say a few words before we get started and uh, turn it over to Jessica. Uh, many of you all know that uh, SDJR started about four years ago. But I want you to realize that this has been something that the division has uh, been working on since 1995. And from 95 to 2010, this was called the MLRA Inventory and Assessment. Now, if you go back into the handbook, the handbook is, uh, has the policy for 610. And the intent of the updates of the soil survey were to be able to develop a seamless national product. And we've got quite a few uh, customers that are interested in this seamless product. Going back into the general manual, we've got guidance on the general manual that specifically stated that uh, we are not to be doing MLRA update products projects until we've uh, completed the evaluation of the, M of the MLRA. And so you can see that we've been teaching this for quite a while, but it had not been instituted. And about four or five years ago, we decided to uh, come up with a system to be able to institute these evaluations and to, eva and to provide some sort of harmonization to develop the seamless product. Now, SDJR, as you know, has three major priorities that we looked at. And we took a look at the, across the nation on the number of DMUs that were uh, assigned to unique MAP unit names. And basically what that did was provide us the number of times that MAP unit had been used within uh, the country. Next thing we looked at was the total number of uh, MAP unit acres. And then we also took into account the benchmark soils and looked at those. And you can see that there's 151 of these benchmark soils that has over a million acres each. So they were pretty significant in the evaluation process. We were going to add an FY15 the NRCS priority areas. And the reason for that is because we've got a lot of agency uh, interest in the work that you all have been doing. Uh, they're seeing the quality of the product increasing. And they're wanting to be able to focus some of these works uh, into specific areas of the agency needs. Uh, more improved soils information. So you're going to see some more of that in the FY15 guidance. We've got three tasks, as all of y'all are aware of. It's the evaluation process, the harmonization process, and the documentation. And what we wanted the MLRAs to be fully evaluated so that we at least could address the workload that needed to be taken care of. We wanted to be able to harmonize this data because all of you are aware by now that the difference in the soil depth and the difference in the composition creates uh, what's considered misjoints when you're aggregating that data up to the math unit level and then supplying product in a regional or a cone of situation. You can literally see the county lines because of those. And we were giving you the flexibility to go in there and analyze all this data that we've got. We've got a tremendous amount of documentation from previous uh, soil survey work. We've got a vast uh, laboratory analysis uh, database that we can uh, go back to to be able to improve the soil properties we harmonize on. And most importantly, we wanted the documentation. We wanted to be able to look at the, your evaluation work and be able to identify what are the future projects that need to be taken care of in these MLRAs. What are the areas that need spatial work? What are the areas that needed additional uh, lab sampling? What are the areas that needed additional transecting? We wanted to be able to provide you a, a system that allows you to evaluate these, harmonize the map units, and then document that future workload to be able to 
uh, go back and build your uh, long-range business plan. We placed a one billion acre five-year time frame on this, and that's uh, one billion is used very loosely, so don't hold me to that. But I, what I did want to show you that as of uh, two, well, actually as of the end of July, we've got about 278 million acres completed, and as of this morning, we've uh, uh, just about hit 300 million acres reported since uh, SDGR took an effect. So that you can see. We are making our way, and we've got two more years left to finish that other 700 million acres. Here's a visual on where you can see the workload has been done. And uh, we have looked across the nation, and we found three offices that were doing a really good job of being able to produce a lot of projects out in, a, in the annual workload. And Steve and his crew is up in uh, New York. They'll be discussing their workload. Ryan is over in Iowa in the uh, uh, area up in the Iowa, Indiana, uh, uh, Minnesota area, Illinois Park. And then Jessica's got down in uh, Texas. And so you're going to be able to hear from all three of them and let them uh, provide to you how they're doing this. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Jessica and let her talk. Thank you. Okay, like Paul said, uh, I'm Jessica Stove, and I am the MLRA leader for the Service School Survey Office. Um, also on my staff are Travis Weiser, Ashley Newsom, and Alan Ziegler. All four of us came to Kerrville about four years ago. Um, Travis and I have worked for 11 years within our CSP, um, and Alan and Ashley just four years ago. I worked in Graham prior to coming to Kerrville. Uh, Travis was in Lexington, Caldwell, and Bryant prior to coming to Kerrville. Ashley worked in the student training in Rosenberg and Ryan, and then Alan came directly to us straight out of college. Also, on our SDGR team, but not on this slide, is Richard Gilmer. Uh, Richard is our SDGS and does a really good job of making sure that we are producing not only a significant number of projects, but also a good quality. Uh, my presentation is designed to give you an overview of the process that we are using here in the building our SDJR project. Uh, and I'll start with just kind of giving you an overview of the, our area of responsibility. Our area of responsibility covers approximately 27 million acres in the southwest portion of Texas and the Edwards Project of the Waste Integration. Uh, we cover NRA's 81A.
we've reviewed all of the OSB that MUD, HUD, and any archival data. Um, we also include all of the MRI projects that um, we created for series that have been that cannot be harmonized in another SBJR project. This document has been sent to the SBQS for review and comment. Heat and holders just use a save and resource tool process for review. Once all of their concerns have been addressed, then we're good to go to begin our work in NASA. And we decided to do this series project summary um, so that we could highlight any issues that we might have uh, when working on these SDJR projects. We wanted to point them out in the beginning so that we didn't get to the very end of our SDJR, SDJR project and then somebody say, oh no, that's not going to work. So we wanted to address everything up front so we didn't have any surprises at the end. Okay, from this point forward, it takes us about six to eight weeks to complete an SEJR for an entire series. When we begin the data harmonization and math, like I said, we work by series. Uh, and we always begin with the mapping in which the OSB is located. We want to assume that the OSB is uh, We want to to assume that the OSB is typical, but we do not see. We look at all of the HUDs and HUDs for all of the uh, mapping that are going to be harmonized and develop our ranges to make sure that the ranges that we're getting from the HUDs and HUDs also correlate to the OSB. Um, so we look at everything and create our ranges for things like depth, fragments, place percentages, carbonate. Um, and this provides consistency between the same series mapping within, in, within an MLRA and expedites the population. Now, so at this point, we could copy the data mapping that's from this first project, paste it into the next project, but we wait until we've made, we've gotten this project all the way through QA so that we're not copying and pasting bad data. We want to make sure that it's in QA and that the data that we're copying and pasting to the next project is good same data. Um, so, assuming everything has gone through QA, we can take this data mapping and copy it in our next project and just adjust the RV, the component data, minor component, uh, and then go on that way. And it seems to have really increased our proficiency and our expediency as far as populating this project. For the component data, um, we're using a 10 meter DEM uh, and running the whole staff and R to develop our elevation ranges and RV for each data path again. We're also running a simple slope analysis in Excel uh, to determine our slope ranges and RV when we're dealing with mapping that have similar but not exact slope spaces. This not only helps us determine our slope ranges and RV, but it also helps us identify mapping that need further investigation and update MRI project with regards to slope. We're running check and comparison reports before, during, and after NASA data population. We run the ASHTO and Unify Man Capability Class both density, CV, ECC, and fraction SIP before calculating the values. As these reports uh, compare the stored values versus the calculated value, we want to make sure that the calculated values are actually close to one. Uh, we're also running the physical and chemical tool properties the data that we're populating in the old data map unit is the data that we're populating in the new data map unit. We run the check report during the QC process to ensure that uh, all of the calculations have been run after we've made any kind of edit. And up here on the left, uh, this is my favorite, and this list of all of the reports that we can on a regular basis. After we've been in all of our data, we run the validation for component, data mapping it, horizon, and horizon picture. And I don't have a whole lot to say about that. It's kind of self-explanatory. The only thing I want to say is that just because you get an error, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have an error. You need to look into it before you go adding data or changing data. Um, the one that I get most frequently is I don't have a high and a low populated for my sand fraction. We don't have a huge amount of lab data, so it's hard to come up with a range uh, for our sand fraction. So I didn't need to populate anything, but I still get a validation here. After we've done all of this, we review the interpretation to ensure that we haven't caused any unintended changes in interpretation. Um, this is a very small list, but this is a list of interpretations that we most commonly use. Um, if they're local roads and streets, septic systems, as well as foundations. But we do receive these to make 
change any of the data so that it changes the complexity that we don't want. After we have looked at all of this, we use a QC QA checklist to make sure that we've populated everything in accordance with exhibit A and B. This is a very small section of the QC QA spreadsheet that we use. Um, but we use it as a tool to communicate concerns or recommendations about the data population between the SDQS, the MLRA leader, and soil science. Our QC QA process begins with everyone in our office uh, completes their own SDJR project from the GS science myself. We'll uh, complete our own SDJR project. Uh, then we submit it to the project leader. You will review it. If you see anything that you don't like, they'll send it back and edit for me. Then they'll be sent back to the project leader. So we'll review it again. Once he's satisfied, then it comes to me, and I will review it. I'll make my comments and recommendations to the back. Then it'll go to the 11, then back to myself. Once the project leader and myself are satisfied, then we'll send it on to the SQS. Once Richard looks at it, makes his comments and recommendations, we'll send it back to whoever completed the project. They'll make uh, edits. It'll go to Travis, then to myself, and then back to the SQS. Um, this, we usually do this about twice. Um, but once all of this is completed and everyone is happy, uh, then we create an SQR template. The SQR template includes a mapping concept, spatial distribution map, which includes soil temperature regime, uh, OSB location, component head on location, MRA boundaries. Uh, it'll include spatial distribution map, a revised copy of the OSB, a summary of the county's HUD, what year they were published, if everything was mapped on the same land form, uh, if they had the same minor component, or things like this. It includes map reports like physical and chemical soil properties reports, engineering properties reports, compares to reports of K, C, W, C, W, E, I, slope analysis if it was performed, a list of any consistencies between the mapping is being harmonized, uh, all available lab and head on data, any county line joint issues or documents, and all of the MLRA projects that were created as a result of the SDKR project are included in this report. The template is reviewed by the SDQS and then sent to the state soil science, the resource soil science, and the MLM leader for comments. Once everyone has reviewed and approved the project, then it's correlated. As a result of all of this work on SDJR, in 2013, we were able to take 252 existing map units and harmonize them into 75 MLRA map units. So now we have new MRI map units that are consistently populated, and they're populated through Exhibit A. They've identified and populated minor components through Exhibit B, and we've identified and documented future MRI updates. At this point, we have created all of our series project summary reports, and we have all of our remaining SDGR projects entered in NASA, and they're pending approval. For FY15, we propose 30 SDGR projects, which will affect 5.1 million acres, and we'll claim approximately 2 million acres. To date, we have identified 231 future update projects as a result of our SDGR projects. We have created a long range work plan that carries us through 2046 at a rate of 465,000 acres a year. These projects address county line joint issues a lack of sufficient characterization data, different surface textures within the map unit, uh, and a myriad of other issues that were identified while working through the SDJR project. I don't have anything else at this point. Um, like Paul said, we'll take questions at the end. So I would like to go ahead and turn it over to Steve Anthony from the Thank you, um, and welcome everybody uh, to the 12 bell portion of the presentation. Uh, what I would like to do today is start by giving you more of a general overview of our office and the processes that we use 
choose to manage our SDGR workload. And then I will turn it over to Matt Havens, one of the two project leaders here in Belmont, who will go into more detail on a few of the specific processes and tools that we use to help us accomplish our workload. This is the Belmont crew. Um, maybe you recognize some of the names. Uh, myself, Mary Ellen Cook, who uh, recently relocated up here from Virginia. Matt Haven, Dean Shields, and Keith Shadle. Um, uh, other than Mary Ellen, the other four of us have pretty much been in New York most of our careers. And here are some of the other people that have facilitated our project work in uh, Belmont. And it's pretty much the same teams as the rest of you have on your side. Um, but we have utilized tech teams uh, uh, pretty extensively, especially in MLRI 139, uh, where we have less field experience here in the office. Um, management teams, the state soil scientists in uh, uh, New York, New Jersey, Ohio, and Pennsylvania have been understanding and cooperative as we work on their soils data. Regional office uh, 12 staff have facilitated the process in a number of ways. Um, we had challenging goals this year, and one thing they did to uh, help with the workflow was require incremental submission of projects for quality assurance and incremental reporting of progress. And that was actually built into our performance plans. And uh, uh, we had a percentage of our goals due each quarter with a balance due on July 15th. That helped us stay on track, and it's also helped SDQS uh, do a better job managing their workload and uh, allowing them time to have everything prepared for the annual refresh. Uh, quality, uh, timely quality assurance. Sean has been very good about this, and uh, this has been very important for our project workflow. Um, it allows us to clean up and complete our projects while they're still fresh in our minds. A few other things you can see there. Um, standard operating procedure, um, uh, specific guidance for Regional 12. Uh, offices, assistance with developing climatic data using zonal stats, processing of OSDs. Um, I believe every series that we've worked on has had at least some OSD revisions uh, between climatic data, metric versions, etc. cetera. Um, and that's quite a workload in itself. Um, exhibit A spreadsheet, uh, we found that useful, and Matt's going to touch on that in a few minutes here. This is our area of responsibility. Um, it's comprised of two MLRAs, 139 is a glaciated Lake Erie Plateau, 140 is a glaciated Allegheny Plateau, and Catskill Mountains of New York and Pennsylvania, a little bit of New Jersey. Um, it's made up of all our portions of 88 counties across four states, and it's a little over 21 and a half million acres in size. According to the national analysis that was completed a few years ago, 12 Bell had one of the highest, possibly the highest, I'm not sure, SDGR workload in the country. And that was based on the number of unique mapping of names that could potentially be harmonized. And there's a number of reasons for this. Um, both MLRAs are glaciated and tend to be highly variable. So we have two quite different MLRAs. MLRA 140 is predominantly septosols, and MLRA 139 is predominantly alkosols. We have a wide range of correlation dates, uh, ranging over 67 years, and that causes uh, differences in mapping and series concepts. Uh, multiple states, differences in slope grouping, sometimes slightly different mapping concepts. That's another challenge. Um, in MLRA 140, we have mesic and frigid soil conditions. So that's a whole another set of uh, uh, soils that we need to deal with. Um, we're including single map unit CMU projects uh, for each series that we're working on in order to bring them all up to SDJR standards, um, including single map unit CMU phases. And we take a very conservative do no harm approach here in this office. And I don't think this can be emphasized enough. So with a large workload that we had, we knew we had to come up with an effective way to manage it. Um, we chose to implement kind of an assembly line or division of duty type approach, which I feel is more more efficient and allows us to deliver the number of projects. 
projects we need to. Um, it also uh, helps us maintain more consistency in our projects and in our data population. As you can see by the flow chart, uh, we have one GS11 and one GS9 for each of the two MLRAs with primary responsibilities for that MLRA. And there is sharing of duties across MLRAs as necessary. In 2014, the 12 bell staff completed uh, 150 FTTR projects containing uh, 220 new MLRA DMUs and mapping them, and affecting 3.5 million acres. And we just made our goal. This works out to about 30 projects, 54 MLRA mapping units and DMUs per soil scientist and campus. Uh, a few points to be made here. Most importantly, this is a team effort in Belmont. Everybody has an important role in the process. And secondly, there's nothing extraordinary about what we're doing here. We basically are following the NI and uh, implementing efficiencies and shortcuts whenever possible. Uh, the third point to be made is this, is this large workload has required some sacrifices to be made. Um, basically, we're spending almost all of our available time on FTJR in order to stay close to the targeted completion time frame. This allows very little time for anything else. So far, uh, people have been understanding and uh, have allowed us to focus almost entirely on SDJR here. The next two slides uh, kind of show how we've split up the duties. Uh, it's color coded by position. And I think it's pretty much self explanatory, so I won't read through each of these. Uh, you can take a look, and Matt's going to be covering some of the items in more detail in a few minutes. But basically, the GS 9s do a lot of the preliminary project work um, head on entry, assembling and summarizing available data, creating spatial distribution maps, and establishing the project in NASA. The 11s provide oversight, direction on the projects, and they're responsible for reviewing the assembled data and making final determinations on mapping the tokens and on typical patterns. They also do the uh, creation and populating of new MLRA mapping and DMUs. This is the second part of that slide. Um, one point I would make is regarding QC, and Jessica touched on it as well, is uh, I also try to do a preliminary check in the early stages of data population uh, of a new DMU in order to catch any potential problems early on. Uh, the final QC that I do uh, begins after all the DMUs of similar mapping of phase have been completed. Then I review them in batches, which is more efficient. I start with a thorough review of one DMU and then compare uh, other similar ones to it. This slide just shows how we prioritize the series to be worked on by high map unit DMU count, high acres, high acre series. Um, and this is nothing new. There's a number of SDTR reports on Pangea that can assist with this. I'm sure uh, most everyone out there is probably doing something similar. So far in our case, these high DMU count, high acres map units or components have corresponded pretty well with our benchmark soils. And um, after we select the priority components we want to work on, uh, we've also made the decision to harmonize the remaining soils with the drainage patina. And this helps us uh, better manage our overall long-term workload and be more efficient and consistent in our data population. It also allows us to increase the number of completed DMUs each year since patina mates are often listed as minor components. So that's kind of a brief uh, general overview of how we're handling the workflow in Belmont. Now I'm going to turn it over to Matt Haven to give you a, a little more detail on some of the specific tools and processes that we have found to be helpful for us. Okay, this next slide, slide that we see here, um, this is what we do after we decide on what series we're working on. The first thing we do is basically look at the whole series and the geographic extent. This allows us to identify some potential future projects even before any other analysis begins. Um, you can look at this map and know if you look to the uh, eastern side of this uh, MLR, MLR 140 or to the western side that there are some 
obvious um, breaks there, like along county lines, that uh, are potential to survive. This is a, what we call Matthew's report, and this was developed um, to help us. And it's one of our big tools that we use. It allows us to get the information we want very quickly, and we can put it all on one spreadsheet. This is available on the MLRA 12 Amherst folder. And this can be run a couple different ways. The way it is currently uh, seen on the screen it has a wild card in the top box. And in the second, it just has the series name, in this case, Martin. We run it this way. This will show us every map unit where there's a component, major component named Martin. If we flip flop that around and put star Martin star in the top box, and then just the asterisk below, that will show us all the map units where Martin is listed in the name. So we can do this both ways to make sure that we're testing all the map units that we want. Once we run the report, this is an example of the output, and it's already kind of pseudo sorted. This shows us the important information that we want to have, which is things like the national map unit symbol, the survey area, the map unit name, the acre, the DMU that's attached to that map unit, and the ownership. The next thing we do is export this to Excel, and we make what we call our preliminary grouping spreadsheet. This slide shows an example of that. This is what it looks like after we have sorted and rearranged and regrouped the map units. This is an example from a project that's already done. That's why it's all marked up with all the color. If we look up to the top and we see the yellow highlighted row, that's the name of the project. In this case, it would be Martin Chanery Silk Loan, 3 to 8 percent slope. We have added a column to the right where we put comments or notes, which we um, glean from reading the map unit descriptions. We put the important items there like landform, minor components, stoniness, land capability, subclass. We can also use this spreadsheet as a checklist. And it helps us to go through in a systematic way and note when we have written the project, when we have completed the project, and when the QC has been done. Also, if you look down to the bottom if you're down about two-thirds of the way, there's a solid blue bar across that row. That is where we identify any future project. Just put some quick notes down about a future project, and that allows us to track those and also track when we've written up those future projects. Once we have all this done, we can start to develop the map unit concept. And at the same time, we also analyze and review any available data with the goal of getting values that we can use to populate key data elements in that, for example, part of the science sector. We also get statistics from the county typical pet on, and we start to take a look at the current OSD. Is it located where it will make sense? Is it in line with the summarized values from our lab data and our Basically, does it represent our findings, or is it time to relocate the OSD test? This slide shows an example of uh, what we call our CUD stats, and these are gleaned from the CUD, uh, a lot of times right from the manuscript. And in this slide, there, the numbers are in inches. And we do a lot of our analysis of some of these basic things right in inches, and then we convert them to centimeters. So we uh, are trying to be a little more accurate that way. Uh, we don't have the luxury of having tons of uh, lab head-ons to use, so we put a heavy weight on our TUD, our county TUD head-ons. We also know they have gone through uh, quality control and quality assurance. The next couple of slides, I want to uh, just show you a few tools um, that we use because 
once we get to this stage, we're ready to uh, put these projects into NASA. One of the things we've developed, uh, basically out of necessity when blowing out as many projects as we have, uh, we needed a streamlined and consistent way to pump out these projects. So we developed a generic template, and we do this for every series that we work on. We start with this Word doc, and then we copy that and paste it into the NASA project description text box. Then we go back to our preliminary spreadsheet, that uh, spreadsheet I showed you a couple slides ago that had all the color boxes. We'll go in there and clip out just the parts that we need and paste it in here where you can see uh, two-thirds down is the paste in project name and county from the spreadsheet. Um, that's what we do. And then once we do that, here's an example of what it would look like. This is an example, again, of the margin foundry built loan, 3 to 8 percent slope. We've gone into that preliminary grouping spreadsheet, clicked out the columns we need, and we paste it right there into NASA. This will, um, like I said, allow us a quick way to do that. The formatting here is not really great, but the information is in there. Uh, we then note any future projects here, and we're basically done with the project. Another tool that we use is the generic, what we call a generic map unit template. This is, these headings here are based on what you see in the National Instruction 305.6, Section D3, which I'm sure you guys all know. And these uh, headings are then populated with the information we get from our historical research and from the OSD. It's important to note that uh, down the bottom here, we list any items or issues for future MLRA projects. This template is modified and tailored to each SDJR map unit, but it gives us a consistent format to do this. We probably could make this more elaborate or put more uh, information in it, but we wanted to keep it simple and concise in light of the number of uh, SDJR map units that we are pumping out here so far. This is a review of the process flow that Steve went over earlier. What this does is really allow us to be working on multiple series or multiple projects um, at the same time. For example, Keith, our GS, one of our GS9s, can be starting his work on the next series on our work list and getting the project ready for approval and uh, producing the map, while, for example, I'm doing my part of the Martin series project and then Steve can be starting on QC of the modern project that I have already finished. Again, we like to do our project in batches, usually all the math units in a series, and then in Katinas. That allows us to help populate some of the minor components of these uh, DMUs that we are creating. This is an electronic version of Exhibit A, as Steve has mentioned. And this is really a key to uh, helping us have consistent um, data population in our DMU. This was made as an electronic copy at, their, at our request of the MO12 staff. What we did is took that and we added a few columns you can see out on the right that says done and QC and notes. This helps us to track every uh, data mapping that we're going through. We do it right in the same order. We make notes when needed. If we have uh, something different we're putting in for some of our values or we have an issue with a validation, as Jessica had mentioned, where we think it's not really an error, we can put that in there and then Steve will notice that when he's going through his QC. But this is really a key to uh, our consistency here at Delmar. Uh, you might ask, um, you know, what happened as a result of all this evaluation and, and this harmonization? You know, well, the result of that, or the answer to that question is future projects, more work to do. 
Uh, we have identified just over 100 future projects, but this easily could have been more depending on how we wrote them up. In some situations, I chose to lump some SDJR map unit into one project rather than just have one project per map unit. But going through this whole SDJR process has confirmed what we already expected. Basically, that there's a huge amount of work that still needs to be done to improve the map and the data behind the map. Future projects that are developed from SDJR are helping us to document what needs to be done so that it won't get forgotten. And we also have the chance to add any of our tacit knowledge that we have for any future soil scientists who will be here after we're long dead. A um, couple things that you hear around our office during SDJR. Um, we also have to make some hard decisions during the SDJR process. It's not always clean. It uh, sometimes can be a little bit messy. We also rely heavily on the national instruction. We rely heavily on spreadsheets to keep track of the vast amounts of data that we have. We joke a lot that we need a spreadsheet to keep track of our spreadsheet. And you, you may have heard the, uh, the joke, how do you eat an elephant? one bite at a time. But uh, with our SDJR project, they contain elephants in themselves. So we often joke that we do SDJR one elephant at a time. As Steve said, it's nothing really fancy. We follow the NI, we just float away. So that's basically how we do it in Belmont, New York. Next, I would like to introduce Brian Dermody from the Waverly, Iowa Soil Survey Office. Well, thank you. My name is Brian Germany. I'm the MLRA leader here at Waverly. I've had 15 years of experience, three as a soil conservationist. And I've worked as a soil scientist throughout Iowa and in Alaska. Um, our project leader in the office is Lee Camp. He has 26 years of experience. He's worked in Fairfield, Iowa, Shotgun, Ohio, and Waverly. And Neil, he's um, has around 10 years. He's worked as in the cartographic unit and then also as a soil scientist here in Waverly. I guess our, our idea is we start SDGR. The purpose is to organize our knowledge to reveal our ignorance. And when I say organize our knowledge, I mean that's where we organize, inventory, and carbonize it. It's the organization. And once we've done that, we reveal our ignorance. Once we reveal that ignorance, we can then um, start making projects to alleviate that. So, um, give you a background on our area. Waverly Soils Office um, covers two MLRAs, 104 and 108C. We're in three states, Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin. We have 11 geomorphic areas, 55 soil surveys, areas. We have 601 unique component names or series. We have, four, before SPGR started, we have 4,620 map units, and our area is about 12.8, 12.9 million acres. Um, kind of the timeline for us in Waverly, um, August and September, we do a lot of time getting projects ready for next year. We analyze, um, write up, and propose them. Um, we present them at the tech meeting usually in August. We try to have them all approved starting October 1. October through June, we work on our projects. We try to get them done by June. That way we give our data quality specialist, the region office, time to go through all of them and make sure they can complete their tasks in time. It also gives us time to um, work in the field. We have some dynamic problems, soil property, soil health projects, ESD field work that we are able to work in throughout the year, June and July when it's nice here because we have our SDGR done. Um, and then August right now, we're kind of starting the process over. Um, when we first started SDGR in 2012, um, this is a picture of our office. We have 11 file cabinets, five map cases, 55 soil survey areas. We have soil data for the last 113 years. That's how far some of our soil data goes back. And we were just thinking, how do we get all this? How
how do we analyze this for SBKR? Um, Beth did a lot of planning with the staff, and we kind of decided we're going to have to organize it first before we can do SBKR. Um, so what we did the first three months of 2012 fiscal year is we scanned everything in our files. That means we spent three of us three months, almost a whole man here, just scanning everything through three to 40,000 papers, pages. Um, we sorted out all the point data, the lab data, the set on description. And one of the one of the benefits this had for us is we were able to get bio copies and copies to the surrounding similar area offices. We also were able to give information that we have to the state office and our university. So, what do we do after we had all of this scan? We realized that our built in software, our Adobe, has a text recognition um, component to it. So, after we have everything scanned, we downloaded the digitized manuscript. We ran the text recognition software on all our files, and that allows us to look at computer source and search for all instances of a soil mapping a name, a soil type. So like here we ran the text recognition and it just finds like on this example Kenyan soil, it just takes seconds to find every of that soil. Um, saves us a lot of time. But also um, it gets all that other information. So on this one it's like all the correspondence, all the field reviews, all the correlation documents. We're just able to copy and paste that into a Word document ultimately the now. So we have every instance for every county that it's in, we can analyze the history of it from when you started mapping to when it was correlated into what it is now in master. So that saves us a lot of time it's just uh, sorting through the files and the amount of information we have is what the computer search all this for us. And then we don't have to do as much typing, it's just a lot of copy. After we get that work, initial organization scanning project done, we decided that we're really going to focus on big acre patinas and figured that the acres will follow because we do the whole patina and all the mapping is just in that series of patinas. So for this example, we did like the quiz series. We entered in all the head ons. All the head ons are what's used to make up the mapping, the mapping is to make up the legend. And then also we were able to do that automation, so we do 2 to 5 percent flow, and then we use that data to help populate the 5 to 9 percent flow, and so on. So for this, and also because we do the catena, the up and down drainages of each series, a lot of our mappings are fully populated because we've done minor components on in their own SBDR projects. So for this split series, 18 SBDR projects, 300 7,000 acres what we expected. Um, makes it a lot easier and helps automate it by doing it in Katina. Um, a lot of our data, we start building a new component from scratch. Um, we use head on data to build the component. Um, we, use all, we enter all our county TUDs. Every lab description was head on NASA. Um, we do a lot of digital tents. Or NASA entry. The digital pen allows us to do this during our telework. So if it's pretty cold and blizzard, blizzarding, we can take a stack of pens, a uh, pen on home and use the digital pen. Um, put everything into NASA and or um, we have the link in my office site and that allows us to download or data dump it back into Excel for other analysis. And then once um, export the data. We'll use Excel, spatial analysts, we use geostatistical analysis to evaluate the property. Usually the, the, the data entry takes up to two weeks, but the analysis will take one to two days. And then another one to two days to populate the NASA component. But we try to get everything into NASA that we have. Um, Example, um, a lot of our data is in paper form from the university site. It isn't in the digital form yet, so we do a lot of set on entry. Um, usually, most of our series, we have 50 to 100 set on. It's usually a third to half of them have lab data. So that's kind of what, why a lot of our time is 
the 85 project rating and projects usually fit every MLRA, every FTR project fits in the time MLRA project. So what that means is a lot of a lot of our um, quote projects might be in one big MLRA project. So we might have a texture phase that will include two to five, five to nine, nine to fourteen quote phases of that map or that series, but they'll be in the one bigger MLRA project. Um, a lot of our future projects we try to write up our projects to improve and drive new data for the soil rate survey. Um, we try to use the GIS geophysical tools on existing data to effectively plan when we write up a future project and also for the management of where we're going to sample. Um, some of the issues we see when we do our project, a lot of our data is based on um, estimation. So we can see a need for a lot better dynamic soil processing data in the future and looking and measuring like cane pad or organic matter or false density. So that helps um, better improve the existing data in that. Um, we want to collect data that has value and meets the needs of the customers. And we focus on what the customers need, um, I think, as opposed to writing projects for soil scientists. We, we can't go wrong and make sure the customers are happy and satisfied. We're trying to work harder. We don't have to work harder in the future. Um, this thing, we have 37 projects in there, but as I said, a lot of these projects are a lot of SDGR projects might go into just one piece. We might have texture bases or data collection that might be as a result of multiple SDGR projects. Um, some of the things we've seen from SBJR is we have done is we have organized a lot of our data and it's produced a lot of questions. Um, we've identified a lot of needs for MLRA 104 and 108. Um, a lot of these needs affect the health, safety, and economics of the data user. And it's a lot more clear now what we need to do in Waverly as we go forward with SBJR. Um, I guess one of the things we've been thinking when we organize our knowledge for until our ignorance, if, if what we know, it should be enacted. All the data we know after SDGR should be in there. It's what we don't know is what makes us useful. If, we, if we're focused on our questions or what we don't know about our, our soil, that's what makes us useful as we go forward post SDGR. So other, after that, I guess, that's all I have. I can turn it over to Paul. Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate you doing that. I hope you all have seen now that we uh, don't have one mold that fits all SDJR. Uh, each one of these offices has adapted to be able to produce their own products. And you'll notice that they all have their way of evaluating their data. They use the data, to, uh, the existing data to harmonize what they've got and come to a common uh, current standard. And they also identify all the future benefits or the future projects that we need to work on. And so when you look at this, you know, a lot of people are asking, why are we doing this? Who cares? Well, the agency cares. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, uh, agency personnel that are looking at this work that you're doing, and they're, they're looking forward to improving conservation planning because they've got this golden egg that we've got sitting here. It's called the Souls Database. We no longer publish manuscripts. We publish Souls Databases. And the vast majority of the information that's in this database is a holdover from the 3SD days. And the work that you're doing right now, you're improving that product because uh, just using the lab data, using the uh, existing documentation, to bring this all up to a common standard has definitely improved the uh, product and our customers, our primary customer being the agency, has begun to notice that. And they're wanting this product completed as soon as possible. Uh, you saw that we've got uh, four years into this, and we've got two more years to do the other 700 million acres. So you can just about understand that you're going to see an increase in the amount of uh, workload for the next two years. But 
the outcome of this is going to be better conservation planning, better state resource assessments, and better seed assessments. And that's the reason why the agency is so uh, geared towards getting this product done. And you can see that's basically what I'm talking about here. We're trying to be able to get the, uh, all of this documentation set up because it's going to come to a point where we've got to decide what offices are going to remain and where the workload is going to be and who's going to receive additional staffing. And a lot of that's going to depend upon the, the workload that we've identified and uh, where that workload exists. So I would uh, caution you to be very careful and very cautious about these future projects. You better think twice about this. Some of uh, our, these future projects are not well written. They're not documented at, at all. And uh, th this information will be mined for future workload. So keep that thought in mind when you're writing these future projects. Then. And I mentioned to you that the uh, agency is looking for support on soils information for the, uh, the land, uh, land conservation initiatives. And uh, one of the things that we're going to be doing is doing a lot of analysis on uh, doing additional workload in these important areas. I've got four areas right now that SEEP has identified that SEEP wants uh, full contingent of data uh, for all their map units in those uh, priority areas. And I'll be working with the regional directors on identifying that and uh, that workload in those particular areas. So you can see that uh, what we what started out as a project to get the MLRAs evaluated has evolved into a, a product that the agency and our customers are now beginning to recognize as something that they can utilize for modeling purposes. And by improving this database, you're definitely setting forth uh, the ability to be able to provide better products down the road. And by documenting these future workloads that we've got, and by doing a good job of documenting these future workloads, you can see that uh, that information is going to be mined in the future to be able to identify staffing. So keep all of these things in mind, that evaluation, that harmonization, and that future workload. They're all three equally important. And uh, in the future, you're going to be starting to see that you're going to be reaping the benefits of all of this work. So, Sean, you know, I'm going to turn it over to you, man, if there's any questions that you'd like to uh, uh, discuss or go back over. Sure. Okay, so we do have a couple of online questions that have been written in. Of course, if you want to type in a question now using the Q&A tab at the top of your live meeting frame, we'll take the questions. Uh, we've only got a couple there now, but uh, maybe there's some here in the room with me. If you do, I come on up and we'll get you in. The first question we have online is, do you find that future projects are often very similar from series to series? And so any of our presenters, Texas, New York, Iowa, want to comment on that question? Do you find that future projects are often very similar from series to series? Well, this is Ryan. I'd say a lot of times a lot of them are texture phases or data population. I mean, how do you, how do you go map where they stop mapping silk one versus silky clay one? Some of that's in the field. Um, yeah, I say a lot of texture things, but also a lot of data, like the, the case that data. I can see that being an issue. It's better to find because some of the when we look at a lot of the interpretation that are derived from these components, a lot of them are based on saturated conductivity, organic matter, and we don't have a lot of good data on that. So a lot of our projects are collecting better data to show what's happening on the different phases. All right, another question, and Ryan, this one is for you, it refers to your last slide, but it says, can Ryan expand on what he meant by the statement concerning the health, safety, and economics of the soil data user in the last slide? Sure. Um, I guess back to the properties, a lot of our data is used for inter by not just us, but other government agencies. So, for example, how we populate the data, where we put our depth phases, our saturated conductivity, our clay mass. That affects properties like large animal, burial sites, septic systems, the 
suitability for septic systems. Um, a lot of farmers here in Iowa, they the DNR requires them to use our maps of where they can put animal manure or um, city human waste and stuff. And we can really greatly affect that by how we populate these data if we don't do a good job. Um, as far as economics, here in Iowa, all farmland is based on the soil survey. It's written into state law. So depending on how we populate it or what miners, we can we do affect what the, the, the assessed land value will be. And we could, depending on miners, we can up that a point or two with the corn suitability rating. So we have to have good records and things to justify what we did because we will have people coming to us, or at least the resource soil scientists or the state soil scientists asking why it changed, what was the reason it's changed. So it's real important to document them in DNAFTA so we can justify what you've done because people are looking at it. All right. Uh, I know we, you know, as Paul mentioned, there's no one way to do SDJR, and we heard three different approaches to how to do these. But nobody talked about the use of Microsoft Access. Do any of you use that tool? We haven't used it in Belmont. We're not using it in Cardinal. No, we haven't used it. We've used Excel and some of the geostatistics stuff. Um, Jessica, here's one. For you, I know in your talk you mentioned uh, doing zonal statistics in R. Could you talk to me about how you learned that, or was it somebody on your staff that learned how to use it, or somebody outside your office that helped you get answers using R? How did you get started using R? Um, well, I've We're not using R for us. Okay. We, I'm sorry. We're using zonal statistics in ARC map. In ARC map. Uh, okay. Yeah. Another online question. How much of the components info within SMU is being retained and or lost? How much of the component info within a soil map unit is being retained and or lost? Yeah. Well, I guess here in Iowa, the old one will be linked with the new map unit. It's just deactivated. We basically start from scratch using PET-ON data, especially if the component, the only thing we have is the H1, H2, H3. We'll, we'll develop a whole new component. So to answer this, uh, Sean, technically nothing's being lost, nothing's being deleted. It's all being retained, and if properly correlated and worked on, then uh, everything is archived and available for use in later years. All right, another question. Are parent material kind, origin, and order reviewed and populated when soil catenas are evaluated? And the question is for all the presenters. Are parent material kind, origin, and order reviewed and populated when soil catenas are evaluated? Yes. Yeah, this, this is Matt in Belmont, and yes, we do that. When we will go through a catena, we usually use the same uh, information. Yeah, this is Brian and Waverly. Yeah, we look at that also. And also, we look at the geomorphology and make sure that geomorphology is in agreement with the catena. Landscape, landform, landscape. Kind of. So an, an, another question about how you size up the, uh, the values here. So what rules are used to determine high, low, and RV values for various properties, depth, slope? What rules are used to determine high, low, and RV values?
I don't know if there is a one set rule for every series. I guess it depends on the data you have and what data after you look at it, what how's the best way you're going to organize it. That's a real good answer, Ryan. It's all dependent upon the data you have and the person analyzing. All right, here's another question on how are TUDs being entered into NASA? Uh, Ryan, I think you mentioned using the digital pen, but uh, what, what else, what other methods are out there? What are people doing to get the TUDs entered into NASA? We're just manually entering the TUDs here. It's directly into NASA. In Belmont, we have uh, one person uh, entering directly into NASA, and one person is using a pet on PC. Okay. Yeah, we use the pen for about half of our pet on, but the pen doesn't allow for the lab data. So when we do the digital pen, it's probably half to three quarters complete once it's imported into NASA. Now the question, in your annual plans, how much time do you budget for average SDJR projects? Say five map units to cover 100,000 acres. Right, I think you used an average figure like four months, didn't you? Yeah, um, four months would be for a big acre, one with a lot of slope phases. If it's like a poorly drained map unit that's only on zero to two percent slope, probably more like two months. But that's just for one person. If I think if all three of us worked on it, we could probably do it in four to six weeks, a big acre one. And so last year we did seven series, and we got done around the middle or end of June. Do you remember what the acre size on that was, Ryan? For last year? Um, last year we did like 56 projects, and it was, oh, I don't know, it was over 300,000 acres, 400,000 acres. All right. Uh, and your uh, projects, is your future work, is the need for additional lab analysis identified? Yes. We're identifying it in Kerrville, and that is one of the biggest things that we're, we're noticing is that we need additional lab data. The answer is yes in Belmont as well. And we also uh, have seen that uh, some of the major uh, uh, properties like uh, KSET and water table data are uh, severely lacking in that, and those drive a lot of interpretations, and uh, that's some things that Okay, here's, uh, here's another question. I noticed all three offices focus on soil series as a starting point to identify projects. So if you choose a certain series, the alpha, do you create individual SDR-JR projects for each unique map unit named using that component, or do you only choose map units with more than one DMU count? How would you handle a map unit that only occurs once? Um. We've done a lot of them here in Waverly. As I said, we do the whole series. So if you had, like, just for example, a Clinton still loan 18 to 24% slope, we had that one county. And I told our region office, I'm going to write them up as a project. And we looked at the data we had for the other slope phases and brought that map unit up to the SDGR standard even though it was what one county. We've done the same in Belmont. Um, we have a lot of counties with multiple map units, and sometimes uh, they may have one map unit that doesn't uh, match with any other county. So it seems to me that we would want to harmonize a single map unit, uh, uh, single DMU map units as well, um, because we don't want to misjoin within the same county. So we are bringing all map units up to SDGR standard. All right. Not yet, but will be. 
Now the question, are you using transect data in every case to justify full population and correlation of minor components? And what do you do if you have no transect data? Um, a lot of our back unit descriptions will say minor components or in not so many terms like soils that are poor or drained or within this map unit. I guess we use tacit knowledge to know if it was a Clyde or a Floyd map unit, the poor or drained version of Floyd would be Clyde. So we can infer some of the minors based on the full description. In Belmont, it's also based largely off the uh, map unit descriptions. All right, any other questions? Another one online, is map scale considered when harmonizing map units, like 1 to 12,000 versus 1 to 24,000? All of ours are the same in Curvo, so that's not an issue for us. I guess in Waverly we have about a quarter or a third or one to twelve thousand and the rest of fifteen eight forty, so they're pretty close already. That's similar in Belmont, uh, between one fifteen eight forty and one to twenty four thousand. Uh, we haven't taken into account map scale. All right, another question online. Is anyone doing zonal statistics for supporting map layers like prism, climate, terrain derivatives, land cover, on individual map unit polygons to evaluate the map unit concepts, or are all polygons considered together for a given map unit or family of map units? Um, I guess here in Waverly, we run it on each map unit. So we'll run zonal statistics on like elevation or prism data. Come out pretty close anyways. But yeah, that and the land cover, we've been putting that in. Just thinking that might be useful as we go into ecological site description for each map unit. All right, but to another question. Has anyone harmonized a map unit that crosses several MOs but remains in the same MRA? No. Nope. I'm not sure I can think of that kind of situation. Um, some of the things we thought about would be like our alluvial unit that might they'll go across into region 10 to 11. And so far we've kind of pulled them off to the later end. I guess our thought was to get experience first before we tackle something of that difficulty. All right, looks like we got a question from here in the room with me. Uh, from what's been said so far, it looks like that uh, additional data that is needed is more of physical data than chemical data. Is that is that kind of a correct generalization? Not here. We kind of we're lacking lab data, and we need both physical and chemical lab data. I would say both in Belmont as well. Yeah, I would say both here in Iowa. So for Paul, or maybe some of the people at headquarters. Uh, any guidance on what goals will be for 2015? Is it going to be acres, project numbers? Anything you can say about that? Well, as the assistant program manager, I'll let you know that uh, we will be working with the uh, regional directors in the very near future on what the FY15 goals are. We have uh, preliminary evaluation done, and we'll be working with the regional directors on that and uh, letting them Pass it on down to the office. 
So here's a question. Uh, is SDJR having any positive effect on making the map seamless or just concentrating on tabular solely? I'll answer that one. Uh, and the reason why I'll answer is because the spatial is will come later. Right now, SDJR is focused on getting the tabular data up to a common standard so that we can begin using this uh, data for our future analysis. As future analysis that's right now, the agency wants. And so once we've got that taken care of, then we'll begin working on the spatial work. Uh, for, for all the presenters, do you coordinate your work with neighboring MLRA soil survey offices? We do keep in touch with uh, neighboring MLRA offices uh, to ensure that we're not both updating the same mapping it, where they were mapping it uh, overlying an MLRA boundary. In Belmont, we, uh, we do communicate with the neighboring MLRAs. Um, it's, it hasn't happened yet to where we were doing them at the same time, same components. Here in Iowa, I usually invite all the surrounding office leaders to the technical team, and also if they can't make it, I'll, I'll send them a copy of our project that was proposed and approved, and I'll try to cause troubleshoot if there are going to be issues or we'll have to do special work with them across between offices the next year. All right. Do most of your future projects need transects to verify composition and component population? Do you update a map unit even though in NASIS you do not have the ownership, but it's correlated in a few of your survey areas? Yeah, if we think it should be in the project, I'll work with that the JSEC office leader and explain why. And we'll, we'll trade ownership. We've done that with the Missouri offices on Illinois or for Minnesota offices. That's the same in Belmont. Uh, a lot of the map units occur along the fringe of the MLRA boundary. And uh, due to the scale of the MLRA map, uh, there's going to be overlap of our map units into adjacent MLRAs, but we still take a uh, lead on those map units. That's the same here in Kerrville. We just communicate with the adjoining MLRA offices. Any other questions? Paul, any closing comments? I think this is a really good uh, webinar, and I think uh, all three of our presenters deserve a good round of applause because they did a fantastic job of, of being able to showcase how there is not one particular way in which everybody has to do SDJR. And uh, I, I thoroughly appreciate uh, Steve, Matthew, Jessica, and, and Ryan for y'all taking the time to do this. And uh, I can see by the questions that we had some really good uh, uh Really good question and answer period. And as always, you know, you've got your uh, SDQSs and your senior regionals available to you. The senior regionals meet every month and discuss any issues on the SDJR. So, uh, you know, stay in communication. The reason why we had this webinar was to basically communicate to you that there is a process. This, this is a need. This isn't something that one person just happens to dream up to keep you busy. 
This is uh, uh, basically driven from the agency wanting good, solid data. And as I said, a database is what we're publishing, and you need to understand the agency realizes that. The agency wants that golden egg because there's no other agency in the country that has that. Uh, this is Roy Vick here in headquarters. I'm sitting here with Paul, and I'm very impressed with the quality of the, uh, the work being done out there in the three offices of the presentations, and I want to thank the three folks that volunteered to do this, and I learned quite a bit because I've been out of the field a year and a half now at the headquarters. And, uh, lost my intimate contact with, with STJR as being a regional director, and it's good to see how things are flowing. So I want to thank uh, Paul and, and Sean and uh, three folks out there in, the, in those offices, and uh, great job. Absolutely. Very, very good, informative webinar. And again, just recap, uh, all of our National Soul Survey Center webinars are recorded and made available on our National Soul Survey Center YouTube channel. And you can search for that. And until next time, happy, uh, happy work with your SDJR work. Thanks, all.